Jesus tells us a parable about a tax collector. And this is what he says. This is recorded in Luke 18. It says, uh, Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisees in Jesus' day <clears throat> were those people, I mean, we say Pharisee these days. It's, it's, a, it's a slight. It's, it's use it pejoratively, right? It's an insult to call someone a Pharisee. Um, in Jesus' day, the Pharisee was someone who was seen generally as a very holy person, generally as someone who was a religious leader, very well versed in Scripture, very close to God was how the Pharisees were viewed. And so Jesus tells the story of a Pharisee and the other a tax collector, someone that was held up on a pedestal in the culture, someone who was an, an enemy collaborator, a traitor over here on the other side. This is what he says. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. I'll put it to you that the Pharisee, who in the story, in the culture at least, would have been held up as, he's the holy guy, <clears throat> he's the righteous person, he's the person to aspire to, and the tax collector being the one who, not only do we not want to be like, we don't even like that person. And Jesus kind of, flips this script and yet in our day today I'll put it to you that the same feeling that the Pharisee gives thank you that I'm not like this other man uh, is something that has not just crept its way into our culture but it's held up as a virtue in our culture and so this is what we're going to be looking at today the current and growing culture of outrage and victimhood. So what I want to do is pray because I understand this is going to be a uh, tricky subject for some and hopefully a challenging subject for all of us and, uh, and ask God to help us. Let's do it. And so Father, I want to thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us. We need your help as always. We love you. We want to be like you. We want to think like you. We want to, we want to have your mind in, our, in all things. And so as we look to your scriptures today, um, please give us understanding. Help us to conform more to the likeness of your son, Jesus. <clears throat> Help us in the way that we think about the culture around us, that we could be most effective witnesses, missionaries, neighbors by understanding our culture better and understanding your scriptures better, understanding who you are, your nature, your character, your will towards us, your love, your generosity, your kindness, and your grace towards us. How you'd have us relate with you, how you'd have us relate to our neighbors, how you'd have us relate to our culture. Help us in all of these ways. In Jesus' holy name, amen. So like I mentioned before, we tend to do these kinds of series about once a year or every couple of years to take some time out, not out of Scripture, we're still going to be in Scripture, we've already been in Scripture, um, to see what is a culture preaching at us? So what is a culture doing? How are they moving? And in preaching something similar to this over the last 10 years, man, the culture in the last 10 years has uh, rapidly progressed in this direction, shall we say. Whereas I remember <clears throat> growing up, shall we say, 25 years ago, let's just call it a generation ago, where uh, people would want to cling to being someone who has not just overcome a challenge but risen above it, to now being a culture where we cling to grievance and we cling to victim and build a whole identity around it. Relationships <clears throat> have become, between any two people or any two groups of people, uh, they are increasingly seen only through the lens of power power dynamics, power relationships, and where there is necessarily someone who's more powerful than another 
which means there is necessarily someone who is oppressive and necessarily someone who is a victim. So increasingly over the last 10 years of uh, my study and even preaching these, these topics, I've seen that not just increase but accelerate as well. It's become a common disposition in general discourse in our country and in the West in general. Uh, we've become really, really polarised. Again, we keep <clears throat> all of these subjects kind of trip over each other, you, you may have noticed. We keep coming back to the same kinds of things, even though we're looking at very distinct issues in our culture, uh, some of the underlying assumptions are shared amongst all of them. We become so tribal, so blinkered by our confirmation bias. These days, we can't just disagree publicly anymore, even privately sometimes. We become enemies if we have disagreement. You're not just someone who I disagree with any longer. You're an enemy. You are othered. <clears throat> you are not on my team. Now, we can agree about a lot of things, but if you disagree with me about this one thing, you are my enemy. In fact, if you disagree with me, you become an oppressor and I've become your victim. This is one of the things that our culture is not just preaching. It is becoming foundational as an understanding in our culture. Uh, social psychologist Jonathan Haidt, he talks about this phenomenon as uh, prestige culture. He says it's, it's a culture buying into prestige culture. You might have heard of like an honor or shame culture in other cultures around the place. He says in the West <clears throat> and in Australia, we have a, not an honor shame culture, we have a prestige culture, the thing that drives us, the things that we want to, that incentivize us to think and move and act and behave and relate in the world. So social hierarchy, your place in culture, is dependent on your prestige. That's what Jonathan Haidt says. Not your virtue, not your character, not your utility, like what you bring to culture, but rather your alignment with, your adherence to, and your policing of the cultural orthodoxy, being the prestige culture. So, and again, I, I want to do a little bit of work, kind of exegeting the culture, and then we want to look again at Scripture and see how we're then going to uh, respond to this culture. So when someone gets called out, like you, you might have heard of cancel culture, uh, you know, you made a big, big news over the last probably five or so years, um, to call somebody out publicly in particular can increase your prestige. And so people are incentivized, especially because we all have access to, whether or not you use it, we all have access to a public platform in social media that can go across the whole globe. We're incentivized to be the first to or to rush to or be the loudest voice that calls out somebody else's wrongdoing brings prestige to the caller, the person who does the calling out, and often social destruction for the callee. Really, it's just it's the veneer of justice. So we hide, as a culture, we hide behind the veneer of justice. Well, I'm just pursuing justice. Can't you see this person said that wrong thing 10 years ago that I dug up and found? Can't you see that <clears throat> we could take this in a particular light, not give it the best reading, but a particular reading and and... If I read it this way and I projected that thing to you, then I look good in our prestige culture. It's a veneer of justice, but the substance is actually just self-acceleration, social acceleration. Some have labeled it uh, virtual signaling, like projecting your, vir your, your virtue to whatever audience is watching. But it's, again, it's not virtue. It isn't, it's not virtue. At best, it's a subjective value projections. He's saying, I, I value this. My values today might differ from my values tomorrow. Certainly they differ from my values a decade ago or a generation ago. But I'm going to project those back into culture so that I can grow in prestige. And your prestige raises. And you can say, see, I care. I care. <clears throat> I called him or her out. I was the first. I was the loudest. I changed my profile pic. I wore the ribbon. I shared the, I shared the post. I clicked the link. I disagreed loudly. I called him out. Thank God I'm not like that tax collector. Jesus, he does speak about this directly. Matthew 6 says, be careful not to practice your righteousness before others to be seen by them. 
Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. Our culture doesn't look to rewards from heaven. It looks to the reward of social standing and social progression up the ladder of prestige. So whenever you give to the poor, Jesus says, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be applauded by people. Whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. So Jesus is calling out the motives, the motivation. He's calling out the heart. He's not saying don't pursue justice. He's not saying don't call out evildoers. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying don't practice your righteousness in front of others. He says, in fact, in another place, he says, do your good works in front of others. Let your light shine so that people would see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. It's the, what are the, what's the display of your good works for? Jesus says, do it so that God receives glory. Don't do it so that you receive glory. He's not saying don't do it. He's saying don't do it like this for this. And so uh, in our public sphere, because we have this cultural incentive to be offended, to be a victim, climbing that social prestige ladder uh, requires offense, requires victimhood. So we live in an age where people are constantly right on the edge of being offended or, or not even just waiting to be offended. They are, man, we have people looking for offense because we are, we are collectively, again, not you in this room, obviously, but our culture, rewarding people for being offended. That's what our culture values. Responding with rage, projecting your victimhood, raising your prestige. Because again, he says, Prestige and the culture of outrage rests on a hierarchy of victimhood. So in a, in a twisted kind of way, the greater the victim you are, the greater your prestige, the higher your social standing. So we, in our culture, and here we're getting to kind of the crux of it, we're incentivized to cling to our victimhood, to hold on to our victimhood, to aggrandize the injustices we have received. And let, let me just do a quick parenthesis here and say, some people even amongst us in the room now have been horrifically aggrieved, have been treated horribly, gr- like grossly, heinously, e- evilly. Some people have been all but devastated by the way that other people have treated them. Uh, again, even in this room. And this is one of the things that makes our culture of clinging to victimhood, all the worse because it becomes harder and harder to identify people who are genuinely in need of great attention and, and help and hope because victimhood has been flattened out as people who have been slighted slightly are incentivized to blow that up out of proportion to the same degree that someone who has been treated horrifically, genuine victims and from an external perspective, it might look all the same. Or these people might be somehow incentivized to be quiet because they see how these people sometimes are rightly treated for trying to cling to victimhood they don't have. So we're we're actually perverting justice under the guise of justice. See this... um, I mean, kind of in an inane way, you see, uh, if you've noticed, reality TV shows uh, over the last 20, 25 years, back in the day, really a lot about talent or some, you know, entertainment or something, and very quickly uh, producers discovered, oh, the people with the stories get the most likes, airtime, uh, favour, votes. And so it's all about your story these days. Who's the biggest victim? In this culture, people who aren't victims can also call out perpetrators of injustice, even for minor ones, and then they can share in or appropriate the victimhood of others. Because again, as a culture, we reward and incentivize being a victim. So for people who aren't victims, they can align themselves with victims, not to help the victim, but to grow their social standing. They're like vampiring, suffering, for the sake of social prestige. Unearned victimhood. 
outrage culture, this victimhood culture, has its own dogma. It's a, it's its own truth that has to be upheld and adhered to. Where there are no rooms, no, there's no room for dissenting voices, no room for disagreement. Again, if you don't agree with me, you're my oppressor, and I become your victim. It's a new righteousness, but with no mechanism for growth, no mechanism for forgiveness, no mechanism for restoration. It's actually, it's bad for us collectively as a culture to career into this direction. It's a new cultural morality. It's birthed out of, but very distinct from Christianity. So where Christianity was like, yes, we want to care for the marginalized. We want to care for the poor. We want to care for the widow. We want to care for the orphan. We want to care for the refugee. In fact, we must. Even when Paul goes up to check on uh, Jerusalem, he's like, hey, am I preaching the right gospel here? And I say, yeah, you're preaching the right gospel, uh, gospel only. Make sure you remember the poor. And he says the one thing I was very keen to do. And so it seems like we speak the same words, but we mean very, very different things. There is right and wrong, but it's subjective right and wrong. It changes due to the collective whim of the mob. There is no grace in this new morality for those who fail the test, nor for those we see as our enemies. Everything becomes zero sum. Everything's binary. You are on my side or you're on the other side. If you're on my side, we share in our victimhood. If you're on the other side, you are oppressing us. If you agree, you're great. If you disagree, you're evil. There's no love in the culture of victimhood except for self-love. By that I mean I I love myself, but I love people who are just like me, people who remind me of me, people who help me. That's just self-love. It's a very easy culture to fall into in our day and age because we have access online again to pick and choose and curate our community like never before. We don't have to listen to dissenting voices. We don't have to listen to disagreement if we don't want to. We could potentially, if we wanted to, uh, go through life, build and carefully curate a community of people online who only agree with us in like an ever-diminishing uh, tribe of people that uh, are purely aligned with us if we want to. And then when we do hear voices or arguments or ideas that are different to what we believe, we can either shut them out because we, don't wanna, we just don't want to listen to them or we can just write them off and say, evil, oppressor, enemy sink into these echo chambers of our own orthodoxy. Disagreement is okay. Only if I'm disagreeing with you. You disagree with me, that's not okay. Because disagreement is, again, it's violence, and I'm your victim. Or if you don't agree with me vocally, then your silence is violence, and again, I'm your victim. We have a perverse incentive structure socially in our culture And it sounds, perhaps, on first hearing, because it has the veneer of of truth and justice and and it sounds a little Christian-y, and many Christians have fallen into it, fallen for it. Uh, It's very insidious. One commentator said, "Uh, the undercurrent of our debates is the growing construction of vulnerability. My field of the psychological sciences must wear some of the blame. It says the limits are placed on the view that citizens can be psychologically harmed if they experience offence and are no longer able to engage as autonomous, rational citizens. It's saying, we've told people, especially our young people, that if people disagree with you, then you are psychologically harmed and they're doing you damage. Therefore, get rid of any voices that disagree with you. It's a horrible solution to a terrible and growing problem. He goes on, says this is more pronounced given the cultural decline of organized religion with a conception of man as moral being. Psychological man has a personality but not a character. The significance of this is that anybody now experiencing emotional distress can more easily blame it upon the outside world, be it on their boss, their biology, or societal structures. This is a critical driver in this age of resentment-based identity politics. I caught up with an old friend recently in the last week who is a psychologist. I was having a chat with him, just hearing from him, you know, how you doing? What do you do? What's what's the, you know, what's the go? Must be awesome helping people, et cetera, et cetera. He said, essentially, 
not, not a Christian man, essentially said, yeah, it's great. What I try to do is to get people to realize it's not their fault. They're, they're victims of their upbringing. They're victims of their circumstance. There's no internal sin. It's only external. Things happening to them. It's not like they are autonomous agents that have decided to do things. No, they're a victim to their externalities. And inside I'm going, you've got to be kidding me, mate. Exactly as this commentator is saying, uh, you can trust in your own righteousness. Thank God I'm not like that person. And we have to draw those lines uh, deeper and deeper and stronger and stronger. If, if, if everything that's wrong in our lives is an externality, if, us, if we don't have any sin or any unrighteousness of our own, it's all external. We have to draw those lines. We have to find enemies. We have to be a victim. Otherwise, if we're not a victim, we are a perpetrator. That's, that's the worst thing. That's like being the tax collector in the empire. It's a crappy gospel. It's not good news at all, actually. What does the culture get right? There are a couple of things I think we can, we can redeem out of that uh, victimhood culture. Firstly, that there is truth. <clears throat> there is right and wrong. There is real. The culture knows it, even though, again, they change their collective minds every five or ten years. Uh, it's an opportunity for the gospel. We can say, we agree the right and wrong, right and wrong exist. Uh, we think it's, it's more objective, actually, than subjective, but there's, there's an opportunity there. Uh, we agree that justice is worth pursuing. There are many who strive against injustice for the sake of the victims of, impre- of oppression, Christians and non-Christians. So this, this is not a slight on every single person. This is just talking at that high level of culture. We Christians should be the most active for justice. We worship a king who is a just king. And he has called and commanded us to be just, to pursue justice, to walk justly. Where justice is explicit, where it's systemic, where it's winked at, where it's uncritically engaged in, we must as Christians, collectively and even individually where we see it, we've got to step in. We have to, have to. We're a people of justice. Over and over, again in the Old Testament, we see God advocating and telling his people to advocate for the poor, the oppressed, the widow, the orphan. The alien. It's one of the, again, one of the worst parts of victimhood culture is that it robs actual victims, actual people who are legitimately deeply suffering of attention and help. And we can't become calloused as humans, but also as Christians, especially as Christians, we can't become calloused to people who are in need, can't become calloused to suffering because we become. Uh, exhausted by people clinging to or clamoring for victim, victimhood they don't deserve. Uh, we can't become callous. We have to have to do the work of discerning who and how we can help. What does this victimhood culture get right? It gets right that uh, injustice should cause anger. Anger is not sinful. The Bible talks about be angry and do not sin. Don't sin in your anger. It talks about God getting anger at sin and at injustice. Uh, and for us, anger, like victim of culture, rightly gets angry uh, at injustice. Again, has with perverse incentives. We also should, be, should get angry at injustice. When people aren't treated rightly, when powerful people exploit the powerless, when vulnerable girls and boys are abused, when the elderly are neglected, when people escaping war are treated like criminals, in many, many, many other senses. It should make us angry when we hear those things, when we see those things, when we meet people who are going through those things. You know, that kind of anger isn't something that we need to do away with. It's something we need to channel into appropriate action. So back to our passage. <clears throat> Why can't we say, thank God I'm not like the unright. Thank God I'm not unrighteous like this guy. How are we to engage with victimhood culture? Uh, I, 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 like you may, you may have picked up from the last couple of weeks, I'm not like culture warrior, yeah, let's go get them. I'm much more 
of the vein of let's show our culture a much better way to live. Let's put the culture of the kingdom of God, the family of Jesus on display. Let's put it out there and invite people into it. And, and absolutely, let's speak into culture where we need to. Uh, but our battle's not against the culture. Our battle's against the idols of the culture. Our battle's against the gods of the culture. So what we want to do is worship our God, the true God, the better God than any of these other gods, any of these other idols, any of these other ideologies or frameworks or philosophies, and then put it on display to show people how we're to live in light of it. So the God, where in victimhood culture, victimhood becomes leveled because everyone's clamoring for victimhood. In the gospel, Jesus is the great leveler. What we see is, actually, there is one righteous person. None of us stand in the position of the Pharisee and say, thank God I'm not like this unrighteous person. Thank God that I carry on my own righteousness. Here's my, here's my list of achievements and ways that I prove my righteousness. No, 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 no. Jesus flattens us all. We are all in desperate need. This is actually why it should be so easy for us to not become outraged and take offense at things very easily. Because when people say, well, you are evil, and we can say, yeah. Yeah, I'm, my unrighteousness is not something external to me. I'm not actually a victim necessarily, entirely, of my circumstances. I actually have sin of my own volition, my own will, or even a mission. But I'm not treated according to my sin by my Heavenly Father. I'm treated according to Christ's righteousness. It's a much, much better gospel because it's true. But also, it's a, it's a much better gospel than, well, you're not, you're really a good person. Feel better about being a good person. Uh, you're just a good person with no agency. So it's not your fault. Don't worry about it. But it is actually. Yeah, we, we bear responsibility for our own actions and activity. But Jesus has paid for every one of them. One of the big problems with our culture is it lacks humility, lacks forgiveness. With the gospel, we can have humility. We can say, yeah, actually I am just like the tax collector. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for not treating me according to my works, but according to your perfect works. How do we do this? How, how do we live as a counterculture of humility and grace, of forgiveness and gospel, in a surrounded by or embedded in a culture uh, with these per perverse incentives of victimhood? Firstly, I think uh, some of the practical ways <clears throat> we can give everybody the best possible reading, even when you suspect poor motives. If you just assume uh, the best reading of things then you won't be participating in the culture around us of speeding to outrage. Secondly, be strong against ideas and gracious towards people. Uh, one of the ways that people uh, argue often in our day is, I, mean, I, I, I posted something on Facebook this week and had people this week commenting on my Facebook doing the exact thing I'm about to mention, where they say, oh, well, I'm not even going to listen to that person's argument because it was made by that person. Or that website, that, that it's ridiculous to even bring them up in like polite company. N not worth engaging with, etc. cetera. Uh, cutting out ideas and behavior and loudly when necessary. Um, we'll, what we want to do is we want to be people who engage ideas with humility, truth, uh, justice, and often anger, but not with offense, not with outrage not self-seeking, self-promoting. Thirdly, uh, we've got to get very good as a counterculture within the culture at differentiating between an attack and a disagreement. Because in the culture, any disagreement is an attack. You disagree with me, you're attacking me. You're pressing me, I'm your victim. And we need to become very good at not buying into the culture. We don't want to do that. We want to be able to say, is this an attack? Or is this... Is this a disagreement? And even if it's a disagreement, 
it's a disagreement that is uh, even, even a hurtful disagreement, one that actually points something out that I might need to change. Fourth, we have to be the people who forgive. When we do suffer injustice, we need to be victims of that injustice without clinging to the identity of victimhood. Again, this is kind of where the rubber hits the road for most of us is that uh, probably everyone has been a victim of some injustice at some stage. Some of you I know, very great injustice. What we can do is we can have been or even currently be victims of that injustice without clinging to, buying into the culture around us and clinging to our victimhood. Our identities in Jesus he enables us to forgive the most amazing injustice. I've seen, I've seen this happen in my life a couple of times. I've mentioned some of these things from my parents where, uh, for example, when my younger brother was killed, uh, by one of his friends. He was a good friend to this kid. Kid was not a good friend to my brother, obviously. Um, and then that boy was on his deathbed. My parents went into the hospital just to forgive the kid. He, he was in a coma, he couldn't hear it. But just to let this kid and the family, anyone watching know, uh, we don't hold this against you. My dad, 18 months ago, was hit by a bus, like literally hit by a bus. Uh, severe brain damage. Um, Speak to him now. Does he hold any bitterness towards that guy? No, he's forgiven that driver, even though the driver essentially got a slap on the wrist. And my dad is still pursuing justice, but he's not holding on to any kind of victimhood. That thing will impact him for the rest of his greatly shortened life. There's no bitterness in him because his king is King Jesus. He's not buying into the victimhood. And, and also, like I said before, he's not, he's not not pursuing justice. He's still trying to pursue justice. There has been a wrong, but he's not doing it vengefully. Applying the gospel and knowing that you are no more deserving of God's grace than your adversary, even if they're doing something horrific or something you strongly disagree with, uh, is key to forgiveness. C.S. Lewis says, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God's forgiven the inexcusable in you. Or Augustine, if you're suffering from bad man's injustice, forgive him lest there be two bad men. Or Jesus, Luke 6, love your enemies. I could just stop there. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Praise, pray for those who mistreat you. So when we forgive, we let go of any feelings of superiority because we recognize our own sin and need of forgiveness. And because we've been forgiven so greatly, we can forgive greatly. We actually let go of our feeling of superiority. We grieve the loss. We don't hold it against that person any longer. We don't hold on to the pain of it. We don't hold on to the, the, the we don't cling to being a victim of that. We don't carve an identity out of it. We forgive. We acknowledge that Jesus can restore all things, including us. When we forgive, we acknowledge that vengeance belongs to God, not to us. In fact, really only when you give up your feelings of vengeance are you actually then free to pray and wish for that person's good. Even if you're still pursuing justice, because sometimes someone could treat you horribly and you can forgive them, and still want them to go to jail, still pursue justice. Also helps us to understand God no longer counts our sin against us. At First Corinthians, love keeps no record of wrongs. God keeps no record of our wrongs. And we tend to undercount our own sin and be very aware of other people's sin, especially in our culture. That's what we're very good at. We're very good at going, my sin is external to me. But when you grieve me, it's because you're evil. Uh, that's not how it works. When we cling to victimhood for its cultural power, or when we rush to uh, offence and calling out heretics of social orthodoxy for the cultural prestige, we're, we're actually like the tax collectors of first century 
uh, Jerusalem who are actually buying into and profiting from the empire. And so when Jesus tells this story, this parable, of the Pharisee and the tax collector, everybody from the very beginning knew immediately, holy man, traitor. This person has bought into, is uh, profiting from, has a better life because, and are reinforcing the rule of the empire. And when we as Christians buy into this, this culture of victimhood, we do the same. I love what Jesus does here where he says, uh, even though the, the you know, tax collectors are compounding the power of the empire by buying into it and reinforcing it, uh, we need the disposition of the tax collector who comes to God and says, uh, it's not my righteousness, actually. Even though we once lived that way, this is the reason Jesus is telling the story, to warn people who cling to their own righteousness, who say, well, look at all my achievements. I am good. Thank God I'm not like this person. Sin is external to me. Speaks directly to our time and to our culture now. We need to be those ones who don't cling to our victimhood, certainly don't cling to the empire, who cling to the grace of God. You know, I've got a heap more to say, but no time to say it. So let's pray and uh, ask God to do a work. And so again, Father, I want to thank you for your kindness towards us in Christ. You didn't leave us as enemy combatants, as traitors, as collaborators. That you came for us. You saved us. You took away every sin, all, every blemish, all shame, every stain, wiped away because of what you've done for us in Christ. And so we thank you. Help us, please, Father, to be discerning in how we engage with the culture around us. Help us to uh, have a better understanding of the culture, its incentives, what it's preaching, its idols. Help us to cling, not to our victimhood, not to the empire, not to the culture, but cling to you, cling to Christ, cling to your grace for us and over us. We know we're so forgiven. And so help us to forgive. Help us to let go of all bitterness. Help us, even as we pursue justice, to not pursue vengeance, but knowing that when Jesus comes back, no sin will go unjudged. No injustice will go unpunished. We don't have to cling to any of those things. Please, Father, help us. And Lord, in every way, help us collectively to be a community, a culture within the culture that a city on a hill that shines its light and says to others, um, come and join us. Be free from your sin, not by um, thinking that you don't have any, but by knowing that Jesus has done all of the work necessary. So God, empower us by your spirit. Keep us close to Jesus in whose name we ask. Amen.